This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon to uh, Gothami's um, confirmation seminar. Just a bit of an introduction about Gothami. She um, graduated from the University of Paradinia uh, in Sri Lanka in 2013. And then she worked, um, she did an internship at the VRI in Sri Lanka, followed by another one at the National Zoological Gardens, also in Sri Lanka. And then she became a vet surgeon um, at the City Pet Hospital. And then from there, she joined us in 2019. And as we all know, it's been a pretty tumultuous um, few years with, um, with COVID and uh, Gothami had a baby in between. So uh, she... She's uh, definitely shown um, uh, an incredible ability to be you know, to persevere um, and take on all the challenges that have come up to her. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like you to like to um, welcome Gothami and uh, and wish her well with her confirmation seminar today. Thanks, Gothami. Thank you, Ann, and I welcome you all to this uh, seminar. So the title of today's presentation is Identification of Host and Parasite Responses in Early Trials Trial Collision. <clears throat> the focus of the uh, today's talk, Australian Sheep Blue Fly, was introduced to the Australian fauna in 1880s with the introduction of uh, worm and merino sheep breed. Since then, it has become uh, a major beast in the sheep industry, causing a significant economic impact. And it's been estimated that the cost of the uh, fly strike in Australian sheep industry is around $324 million for each year. And let me briefly introduce the uh, sheep blue fly. And cutaneous meiosis or the fly strike means the infestation of sheep by the parasitic larvae of Lucidia species. In Australia, more than 90% of the fly strikes are initiated by the Lucidia caprina. Most of the cases occurs in the breach area. You can refer this picture. Uh, more than 80% of the cases occurs in the breach area. But it's not uncommon to see cases in the body or in the places like it. Now let's be briefly go through the life cycle of the Lucilia caprina. So it starts when uh, rabbit female flies uh, go and ovipositate on a susceptible sheep. And usually flies to uh, lay about 200 eggs, and they usually uh, lay eggs as a group so they can prevent the desiccation of the eggs. Within 8 to 24 hours later, the uh, first larvae would come out from these eggs, and then they undergo two development stages within the uh, sheep to become second star larvae and third star larvae. It's fully fed third star Talking about the pathogenesis of the disease. As I mentioned before, uh, female flies, they, they go and oviposit on the susceptible sheep. And within 8 to 24 hours later, uh, first insta larvae would come out from these eggs. And they have these small spines in their uh, mouth, which they use to abrade the skin. Same time, they will release a lot of enzymes, which degrade the host tissue. And this uh, mechanical and the chemical uh, reaction would, would uh, stimulate the inflammatory reaction from the host, uh, host tissues. And the collective action of uh, host immune response together with the mechanical and chemical damage of the larvae would result in a rapid development of an exudative wound. So initially, we would observe behavioral changes like uh, tail twitching and biting the affected area. Then we would observe physiological changes like fever, anorexia, and the reduction of body weight. And this would get complicated with the secondary bacterial infection, which results in luminal stasis, sepsis, ammonia toxicity, and if not treated, like it would result in death. And we would also see a reduction in the performances, like uh, reducing the wool cut and the quality, and sometimes lamb losses in the affected ewes. Uh, so now let's talk about the predisposing factors. Any, anything that would make the fleece of the sheep uh, smelly and damp would result in fly strike. 
this uh, merino sheep breed they are susceptible because they have a lot of wrinkles and dense wool cover in their uh, in the body and uh, the wrinkles and and the uh, ability to uh, freeze to retain the moisture would provide the the uh, favorable microenvironment for the larvae so that will result in the fly scrub similarly uh, uh, urine and fecal staining in the perineum, as you can see in the first picture, uh, it would attract rabbit flies. And bacterial and fungal infections in the skin, like filis rot and dermatophytosis, would result in the fly, uh, fly uh, strike. And fecal soiling of the fleas, especially in animals that have diarrhea, you can see in the second picture that the gut area is covered with drags. Those animals are highly susceptible to get the fly strike. And uh, presence of lesions like shearing cuts and mullicin wounds, and especially if the animals are already having fly strike lesions, then they are very they are susceptible to get uh, fly strikes. Not only that, but uh, but climatic conditions like high temperature and low wind speed would uh, result in more fly activity, and therefore they get uh, there's a high chance of having fly strikes in sheep. And let's see what are the current treatment and control methods we have. So the treatment is basically centered around using insecticides. There are about six group of insecticides that we use currently. And fly trapping is another method uh, in which we can use odor-related catching devices to uh, catch the flies and uh, to reduce the fly population. Uh, and there are other sheep management practices like shearing and crutching, which can reduce the susceptibility of the sheep. Here, what we do is, we re in, in shearing, we remove the fleas from the body, and in crutching, we remove the uh, fleas in the reach area of the animal. Mullazin is another method that we use. Uh, here, what we do is, we remove a part of the skin in the reach, uh, in the in, uh, perineal region, and once this wound is healed, the area we get is devoid of wrinkles and the skin folds. So there's a less chance of having uh, fecal contamination in the breach area. And it's highly effective in controlling the breach strike. Uh, tail dogging is another method that uh, practice to control the fly strike. Here we uh, amputate the tail at the third uh, caudal vertebra. So we, for, by doing this, uh, surgery, we can reduce the contamination of the tail and the breech area from the fecal matter. It's important to regularly inspect the flock so we can identify the animals with the uh, uh, early fly strike lesion and we can treat them. There are novel control strategies that are still uh, under the experimental level. For an example, use of entomopathogens to control the fly strike, like Bt toxins and fungi like metahasium. Uh, this, this method can be used to control the fly strike. And genetic manipulation of the fly using methods like CRISPR Cas9 and RNAi uh, can also be used to uh, control the fly strike, but all these methods are still under experimental level. And vaccination is another method that we can use to control the fly strike. There have been a lot of vaccine antigens. Uh, that have been studied, including natural antigens and concealed antigens. And some of these antigens showed retarded larval growth in in vitro and in the OSAs. But uh, there's no commercially uh, available vaccine at the moment. Uh, selective breeding of sheep is one of the methods that we can use to uh, produce animals that are resistant to fly strike. It's a long-term procedure, but we usually do here is that we uh, select the animals based on certain indi indicator traits like urine color, wool color, and, and the presence of less jags in the beach area, presence of less wrinkles and resistant to the flea shot. Uh, so AWA has developed a scoring system, and we can use this scoring system as a guide to uh, select our animals. And animals who have higher scores can be removed from the uh, flock, while the animals have a good score, like uh, score two, can be used in the breeding program to get a progeny that are less uh, susceptible to the fly strike. 
so in 2005, AWI has started funding a, a breeding program, which was conducted in two climatic zones in Australia. Uh, one was in South uh, Western Western Australia, and the other one was in Armadale, which was in, belongs to the summer rainfall zone. What they have done here is that they have monitored the animal and animals that are not struck by the blue flies, they were selected and used in their breeding program. So they have maintained this breeding program for about 15 generations. And once they analyzed the data, what they have found is that the proportion of the total variation they have observed in this animal can be uh, explained with the uh, differences in their phenotypic characteristics. So some of these resistant animals have uh, physical characteristics like less uh, breech wrinkles and less gaps and, and less urine coloration in the uh, breech area. However, a proportion of these uh, resistant animals, they, they, their resistance could not be correlated with these phenotypic characters. So then we get the question, what other factors could explain this resistance? So assuming that it could be the, 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 their immune response, so this, this resistant animal could be immunologically different to the non-selected animal. Assuming this fact, we use this research block in our study. So we got seven breed strike uh, resistant and seven breed strike uh, non-selected uh, sheep from the CSIR facility in Armadale, and we use those animals in our study. So we hypothesized that the, this resistant uh, sheep, they have different cellular and you know, uh, cytokine profiles uh, when we compare them to the non-selected sheep. And uh, secondly, we hypothesized, uh, in this second hypothesis, it doesn't have anything to do with the breed strike resistance or non-selection. Here, what we assumed is that the larval molecules produced at the early uh, fly strike lesions, they are essential for the uh, survival of the larvae. So based on these two hypotheses, we uh, design our uh, study. So the objective of this study was to compare the host and parasite responses in animals selected to breed strike resistant and uh, animals that are not selected to the breed strike resistant. And as the second objective, uh, we were planning to identify potential drug targets or vaccine targets using the RNA technique. Uh, using those molecules we identified in the early uh, price right lesion. So here I have listed uh, the aims that I'm going to use to uh, test these objectives. The first aim was to compare the composition of the cellular infiltrate in flies right lesion from both selected and non-selected sheep once they are challenged with the glowfly larvae. So the, the aims that I have com already completed will be highlighted in red color. And the second aim was to compare the cytokine production in the skin of these sheep. The third aim would be to identify the protein candidates using previous proteomic and transcriptomic data to, to knock down these uh, uh, protein molecules using RNAi technique. And the, the fourth aim would be to identify proteins that induce lethal effects once we knock down these proteins using RNA. And in this slide, I'm going to talk about the rationale behind this thesis, why I'm trying to look for an alternative control strategy like uh, finding a new drug target or an effective vaccine candidate. As I mentioned in my previous slides, there are several control methods available uh, in controlling fly strike, but still we are facing different challenges with the current control methods. For an example, development of resistance to the existing insecticides. So, so some, some of the blue fly species have shown resistance to the uh, insecticides that we are currently using. Uh, not only that, but contamination of wool and the environment with the use of insecticides and acute and chronic health issues with some of the insecticides like organ phosphates. Uh, and selective breeding 
uh, I have mentioned that selective breeding is one of the effective way of controlling fly strike, but still it takes a lot of time. And mulazin is also uh, effective in controlling the breed strike, but uh, it has an anim animal welfare concerns. So because of these uh, limitations, it's, it's important to look for other you know, alternative control strategies. So then we have designed our study. Uh, First, we selected seven. We, first, we used uh, seven breed strike select, selected sheep and seven non-selected sheep. First, I, have, I collected serum samples from uh, both sheep group. Then I selected random site, uh, eight random sites from the back of this animal. Out of these eight sites, four sites were implanted with the uh, dental plugs containing low flyers, and the remaining four sites were implanted with the mock plugs. Then we monitored the uh, sites for the evidence of larval hat. Once we saw the larvae, we started collecting samples from both infected and the mock sites every three hours for four times. And at the uh, fourth time point, we again collected blood samples and skin bulbs were also collected. And these are the samples that I have collected. So I got larvae from the resistant and unselected sheep. Then we got skin washings. Here I use a PBS containing proteinase inhibitor to wash the skin uh, of the infected and mock sites. And then we also collected skin biopsies from the infected and mock sites of the resistant and unselected sheep. Then also uh, we got serum from uh, before and after the larval challenge. And in this slide, I'm going to talk about the materials and methods that I have used to uh, achieve my first aim. So the skin samples were first fixed in focus and paraformaldehyde, and then the paraffin sections were stained using uh, HNA staining. And part of the skin samples were embedded in the ICT, and they were frozen in liquid nitrogen. Then these uh, frozen sections were stained for di different immune cell populations and the stain cells were counted on the high power field. So these are the results I got. In this uh, first uh, slide, you can see, in, in the first photograph, you can see it's from uh, a control site. And in the second picture, compared to the first picture, you can see that... So that includes everything from writing uh, to speak. So in the in the second picture, you can see uh, a purple color area showing the uh, showing uh, an infiltration of leukocytes into the area where the larvae were feeding, compared to the control sites. But when you have a closer look, what you can see is uh, accumulation of neutrophils. And also, we can see some eosinophils uh, as well. And when we analyze the, the immune cell populations of infected and control sites of the uh, resistant and unselected group, what we saw is that there's a, a significant influx of the uh, CD4 and CD8 positive cells, as well as CD45, gamma delta, T19, and CD1 positive cells in the infected sites compared to the mock sites. However, the analysis of these cell counts in between resistant and non-selected sheep showed that there is no statistically uh, significant difference. In this graph, you can see that in between resistant and, and non-selected sheep, there's no uh, significant difference uh, but you can see a difference in between the control and uh, in the infected sites. Similar observations were uh, similar observations can be found in the other cell counts as well. But to see this, uh, so to confirm these results, I have used uh, a statistical test. Here I use linear mixed model with prescription maximum likelihood method. So in the second column. Uh, you see the mean cell count of the infected sites. In the third column, you can find the mean cell count of the mock site. And in uh, fourth column, you see the effect of the infection. And in uh, the last column, you can see the effect of the resistant phenotype. 
For an example, if you see the CD4 cell count, in infected site, the mean cell count of, uh, is around 33. And in mock site, it's around 6. So there's about five-fold difference in between the uh, in mean cell count in between the infected and mock site. And if we see what makes this difference, is it because of the larvae feeding or, or because of the breed strike resistant phenotype? When we analyze the data, what we can see is that the effect of infection or the effect of larvae feeding is around 0 0.01. So it's less than the p-value, uh, which means it's statistically significant. And when we see the effect of breed strike resistant, on the differences that we have observed in the infected and mock sites, we see that it's higher than the uh, 0.05, meaning that it's not statistically significant. So similarly, in other cell types, as uh, similarly in other cell types, we can see that the effect of infection is statistically significant, but the effect of resistant phenotype is not statistically significant. So in conclusion. We can say that the presence of larvae resulted in a large cellular infiltrate of leukocytes into the infected site uh, compared to the mock site. However, the effect of breed strike selection uh, did not have a statistically significant effect on the differences we observed in the infected cell count, infected site compared to the mock site. So, what does this mean? Either there was an inadequate exposure of larvae to generate a specific immune response, or uh, the variation reported in this resistance is not due to the differences in cellular component of the immune response. So in my second aim, uh, my second aim was to compare the cytokine production in this selected sheet. There have been previous studies done to show that there's an upregulation of inflammatory cytokines as part of the immune response to Lyselia uh, larvae. And in this study, I'm going to compare the cytokine profiles from both weed strike selected and non-selected sheep. Uh, so here I, uh, um, I have already extracted protein from the skin samples using this kit. And then I have to measure the protein concentration. Then I'm trying to use Millipex cytokine, uh, Millipex O1 cytokine kit to, to uh, uh, detect the cytokines present in the skin samples. So I have run my first batch and got higher concentrations of uh, cytokines in the standards and controls uh, than the expected values. So I have to do a bit of optimization and, and after doing some troubleshooting, I have run my, uh, another batch. So the subsequent run gave a satisfactory result. Now I'm uh, planning to continue analyzing my study samples. And the third aim would be to uh, uh, use RNAi to identify the potential function of certain selected proteins on the larval survival. And uh, here, so we use data from previous transcriptomic study, which was done by uh, Dr. Perry and Professor Bowles. So what they have done is they have allowed larvae to develop in sheep skin and also in liver samples and uh, agar plate. And then they have analyzed or compared the transcriptome of this larvae. So what they have found is that certain genes are highly expressed when the, when the larvae were feeding on the sheep skin. Uh, compared to the liver and the agar sample. And they have identified these, pro uh, they have selected these proteins to be used as candidate proteins uh, uh, in, for our RNA uh, technique. And in, in the study that we have done using the strike uh, resistant and non selected sheep, we got uh, our larvae. And, and from this larvae, we we, we were trying to compare the ES products uh, from the larvae that were raised in the uh, agar plate. So we were comparing the proteins released by the larvae that were feeding on the early fly strike lesion 
to that of the larvae that were feeding on a uh, that that were that were allowed to develop on a uh, egg uplet. And once we analyze the proteins, what we have found is that certain proteins are highly expressed, or certain proteins are high, uh, detected in high concentrations in the ES products of the larvae that were feeding on the uh, sheep skin. So using the data of both of these studies, we got a list of candidate proteins, which I'm going to use later to do the RNA technique. This is the strategy for RNA technique. First, I have to identify the candidate proteins based on previous transcriptomic and the proteomic data. Then I um, have to develop functional double-stranded RNA. And then I'm going to, uh, uh, then I have to deliver those double-stranded RNA to the, uh, to the insect. So here I'm going to use NVO uh, micro-injection method because it's, it, uh, so because it seems uh, effective compared to the other methods. And then I can assess the, uh, the knocking down effect just by looking at the biological phenotype, or I can use Q, uh, qPCR to uh, monitor the effectivity of the uh, target gene knockdown. And I have already selected one, uh, seven proteins from the, the list that we have prepared using previous uh, transcriptomic and proteomic data. These are the criteria uh, that I have used to select my protein, whether the protein is predicted to be secreted during the natural infection, whether it's highly expressed during fly strike, whether it has a lethal effect or not, based on the studies done on Drosophila using these proteins. Uh, and also I have looked at the potential function of these proteins. Uh, and these are the materials and methods that I'm going to use. So I use a fly colony maintained by Dr. Perry at his insect team in Bio21. First, I have to collect eggs in a piece of dyed meat. Usually eggs are eggs, uh, uh, usually fresh eggs, which are less than half an hour old, are used to uh, inject it. So these eggs are first line up on the uh, edge of a cover sleeve, and then uh, micro injections of the RNA using uh, RNA is done using anterior injection methods. And then these injected eggs are incubated at room temperature in a humid petri dish. Then uh, we can monitor the larvae for the survival and the uh, presence of desired phenotype. Uh, in this slide, I'm going to share uh, information about a study uh, done on a protein called uh, mesh protein. It's an extracellular protein involving smooth septic junction assembly. There have been studies done on this protein in Drosophila, and this study showed that the, uh, the larvae that have this protein knocked down uh, show a death uh, when they are at first in star larval stage. So Dr. Perry carried out similar study in his lab using the uh, mesh protein, and, and what he has observed is uh, that uh, in this first picture shows the larvae of control group. So uh, they are feeding happily on the nucleus. And in the second picture shows the larvae that has uh, mutant, that, that has the mesh protein knocked down. And these larvae, instead, instead of feeding, they are crawling away from the nucleus. So I am trying to use this same protein to get trained with the microinjection procedure. Uh, and to, to decide which concentration of the double stranded RNA can be used uh, to inject to get an effective uh, knocking down process. And these are the summary of results and progress to date. So uh, I have found that there's no apparent difference in the B and C T cell population present in the wound initiation in the strike selected and non selected uh, sheep. And also methodology for cytokine analysis of the skin samples have been established and micro injections of the blue fly eggs has commenced. And in the coming weeks, I'm trying to select the genes for evaluation of, uh, uh, evaluation of those genes using RNA check. And this is my thesis outline. In the first chapter, I'll be describing literature review, which includes the introduction to the fly and current control methods, 
and the rationale behind this uh, thesis and the key objectives. In the second chapter, I'll be describing the materials and methods. And in subsequent chapters, uh, I'll be describing the aims that I use to achieve my objectives. This is my time frame. So uh, the black color shows the task that I have already completed. And here there's a gap, which, as uh, Vern mentioned before, that I have to, I, I stayed in my home for about two and a half years because of the COVID pandemic and with some family commitments. So then in April in this year, I, I restarted my uh, work. So there's a, a, about two and a half year gap here. And the gray color, dark gray color shows the tasks that are in progress. And light gray color shows the tasks that I'll be doing in the future. And uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, all of my supervisors, including Professor Bowles, uh, Dr. Perry, Dr. Amstead, Dr. Baxter, and Professor Sherling, and my advisory committee chair, Professor Carol Hartley, and Jane Smith from the CSIRO, Professor Graham Hentworth for supporting me with the statistical analysis, and Professor Corbin Hedru, and Hub Temu for supporting me uh, analyzing the immunohistory chemical studies. And Dr. Ravegam and Tina and Shilpa and all of my friends from the building 400 and by 21 and my family. And last but not least, uh, University of Melbourne by 21 and Australian Golden Nation for, for the financial support and for giving me this golden opportunity to study in this prestigious university. And thank you all for attending this uh, seminar. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gathami. Uh, that was um, a good presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, open up the floor now to anyone who wants to ask um, any questions. Uh, I can't see any in the chat, but does anyone want to just pipe up and, and ask a question of Gathami? If I could invite someone. I'll ask a question. Okay, thanks, Carol. How are you going? Well done, Gathami. You did very well to get through the hiccups at the start, but we all heard you loud and clearly. So well done. Thank you. It's a trick. Um, so my question is about, so your initial experiments where you looked at the cellular infiltration um, in your animal studies. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is about, I know why you only did one time point, that's quite clear because they are like sheep um, studies. So um, I guess my question is really about, has anyone ever done anything sort of ex vivo with sort of skin taken from sheep and then sort of in the lab, um, you know, because that would give you an opportunity to look at different time points rather than looking at, for the cellular infiltration stuff at least, sort of focusing on one time point because I imagine, but I don't know, I imagine like the differences between the resistant and the non-selected sheep are probably quite subtle in some of those areas. There's not going to be something that goes sort of blam. It's, you know, one thing, there might be a couple of different things. So I wondered if there was a way of looking at time points for um, different things like that. Yeah, so previous studies done on, on sheep, on the cellular infiltration, like within 48 after the infection, but this one, it's very, very, so we wanted to focus on the early phase of the flies, right? That, that's yeah. why we, we took our, like, that's why we terminated our, our study within 36 hours post implantation of the eggs. Yeah, but I have no idea whether anyone has done it, like using sheep skin samples on the ladder. Yeah, I don't know. I, I imagine that's a thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, they might be able to go anywhere, but, um. Yeah, so I understand why you've gone the earlier samples, but they might be um, to, to look at the early stages, but I just wondered if there's an opportunity somehow to look at um, sort of different time points. And I guess you can do that with your washes and things. You've got a few different time points with the washes so early the on. So, maybe washes. Yeah. Yeah. so we looked at the protein concentration of those skin washes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. 
All righty. Thank you. Yeah, and just on that, Carol, the hard, the hard, well, if you isolate the sheepskin, you know, you sort of, you lose the dynamics because once you cut it out, it starts to die. So you could look at protein secretions from the larvae yeah. as they're feeding early on, but we yeah. can do that on the sheep. It's just to get the dynamics. You really, I, What we wanted to do was do biopsies at time points across the line as yeah. the sheep were infected, yeah. um, but animal ethics um, killed no, it. And, and the other thing, I guess, in that is neutrophils. Did you look at things like like non non adaptive cells like CD4 and CD8 you've got and gamma deltas, I guess they're innate as well, but other things like neutrophils and- I, I tried counting neutrophils, but there's this severe infiltration, so it's really difficult to count yeah. cells by it. Yeah, are there markers? Are there neutrophil markers in sheep? Uh, not that I'm aware of, not uh, that I'm aware of. But All right. JP, can you answer that? Yes, not that, not that I know of. The only thing that you can look at is through histology, you can uh, do staining for the neutrophils, just a classical neutrophil staining, but it's not an antibody. Yeah. So okay. It makes it a bit more difficult. Yeah. In terms of looking at a tampon, one of the things you could do is to have to have infections or put larvae on, the, on different parts of the sheep at different time points and then kill the sheep and collect all the samples of, you know, four or five different points. So you could start in the morning and do, you know, put them on uh, and then go, go along the whole day and then at the end kill them so that you have the same end point, but the time that the larvae have been on the sheep differs because you have put different parts at different time points uh, throughout uh, the trial. Okay, thank so you. You could do that if you wanted to use one sheep and get all of the time points, you know, uh, at the end. Yeah, like a countdown rather than a count up, which yes, is what we're doing. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Good on you, Gathami. Uh, yes, so, so there, there's a question from Paula about would uh, animalistic dislike the uh, that cause of cumulative burden. Yes, dear. The animalytics, why do they refuse to get you to take different samples? It's because of the cumulative burden, yes. That's why they ask us to terminate it. So, okay. yes, Paula. Have we got any other questions of Kathami? Oh, Simon, Simon Baxter. Simon, have you got a question? Hi, hi, Gathami. Yeah, I've got a question. Hi, uh, Gathami, you're using RNAi to try and uh, knock down gene expression. Yeah. And you're using uh, microinjections. But I suppose the other way to deliver RNAi is through feeding experiments. Yeah. For example, putting larvae on meat that has RNAi solution already added. So I guess... What are the advantages of uh, micro-injecting the RNAi compared to the feeding experiments? Have you, yeah, so can I, you explain why you're doing paper. injections rather than feeding? Yeah, so the, I, I read several papers and what they have mentioned is that when you feed the RNAi, like when you feed the double-stranded RNA, uh, like with, with the feeding or with food or something, we don't know how what, what concentration of double standard RNA go into the insect uh, compared to the injection method. Because in injection method, we know what concentration we use to inject them. But in the feeding method, we don't know how much they will ingest and how much double standard RNA would go into the uh, into the system compared to the micro injection method. So maybe that is one one advantage we have over the feeding. Like we know the what concentration we are injecting them with. Well, I suppose that answers the question. Okay, so is your uh, primary objective just to, to characterize perhaps the function of these genes, or are you looking for a, a, a potential to use RNAi as a potential drug for pest control? My idea is to, to identify the function of the protein. So if, 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 I, if I silence those proteins, 
if it would induce a lethal effect on the larvae, then I can target that protein to produce a drug target or, or a vaccine. Okay, so how, how do you think you would target some spe specific proteins for pest control? It's like controlling the, the, the Lucilia species. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, these genes are responding to um, being overexpressed in uh, larvae that are feeding on sheep. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, how, how they so could potentially be used for more that, pest control. Yes, yeah, so let's assume if we target a protein that is crucial at the, at the first install stage. So if we can target that protein and if we can knock down that protein, the larvae wouldn't develop into the second star or third star stage and the larvae would die. So we wouldn't get a fly strike lesion. That's what we are targeting, like not getting a fly strike lesion on the sheep. So if we target the first install larvae, which are most vulnerable compared to the second, second star and third star, and that way we can we can control the pest without developing without getting an advanced uh, wound on the sheep. Okay, so it sounds like you're you've got a, a bunch of candidate genes that you're going to look at, mm -hmm. and but it's not really clear what the um, mechanism will be to use those genes for pest control. Is that right? So my point was to find a protein that induced lethal effect at the very, very first stage or the first instar uh, stage and to, to, uh, to prevent the development of second star and the third instar and thereby to, to get uh, like to, to prevent the formation of a fly strike lesion. Yeah, so I think Simon too, the other, the other approach is um, so vaccination is one possibility, but the other possibility is, is a, 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 new, a new class of insecticides that we might be able to come up with. If, uh, you know, new, a away from the current um, targets, which might then give us, buy, buy us more time um, with, you know, by having a new insecticide on the, in the, on the market to mix with the current bunch while we still work out what, whether it's feasible to do the vaccination. Okay, thank you. Is that right? All right. Um, are there any other questions? I'm conscious of time. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right. Well, look, if, if not, then we'll, we'll wind it up. Um, if the uh, Gothami's advisory panel can stay on the line, uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion now about um, her, her seminar. And thank you everyone for, um, for your attendance and for your questions.